Hello and welcome back to The Andrew Haynes Show. In today's episode, we had the pleasure of having on Christopher Keen, the current CEO of the Oahu League, the largest youth soccer league in the Hawaiian Islands. Chris started his career in sports when he was a teenager, when he bought a soccer team so he could play professionally with his friends. Throughout his career, he has held several positions for an array of soccer teams and leagues, ranging from coach to manager, and most recently, CEO. Chris has a deep passion and a vast knowledge of the sport of soccer, and it was a pleasure having him on today. We hope you enjoy. I want to thank you, Chris, for, for coming on the show. Um, let's kind of start off, kind of give us your, your history, you know, like, you know, where it all began for you and, and kind of give your journey to us. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so when I was about 16, um, there was an opportunity to play in the indoor arena national championships kind of thing. And uh, we just built a facility where I grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania, of uh, called Family First. And uh, so I literally put a team together of my friends and uh, went out and got coaches for us. It wasn't even our club team. It was a mixture of guys from other clubs. And uh, we hired the coaches. A buddy of mine went out and started talking to sponsors. You know, we got dressed up in our little suits, started meeting with people. <laughs> it was ridiculous. We were, I think, 15 <laughs> or 16. And uh, I organized the whole thing. And then some, uh, some parents helped out. They drove us out to Kansas City for the Nationals and we got to play in the National Championship. So it was, it was kind of cool. So that was my first... Uh, first taste of management slash while well, I was playing too, but uh, yeah, doing that. And uh, so it was kind of cool. And then uh, from there, uh, just went on to play at Buffalo State. And uh, a couple years after I finished my, uh, my undergrad, I moved down to Maryland to work for a sports marketing firm. And uh, some of my buddies were working in front offices of colleges. It's like, how, how did you do that? Uh, I'd love to get into working and be an athletic director at some point in my life. And uh, I said, oh, I went and did this higher education administration master's degree. So do it. It'll help. So I finished, my, finished working down in Maryland, came back, did that. And uh, my goal was always to be an athlete. So I was a college coach as well. Worked at Salisbury University, Buffalo State, and Kenesha College as an assistant coach. And uh, from there, kind of just got involved in soccer, finished my master's degree, and said, oh, there's no soccer team in Buffalo, and I want a job in sports. So uh, just had some crazy idea, sat down with some friends, and uh, said, let's do this. And they all said, you're insane. Cool. So we all want jobs in sports, too. So we were all like 25 to 28 and created our own jobs. We went out and created a business plan with the Small Business Center of West New York, um, got investors, formed a youth academy, formed a camp clinic program. Uh, eventually had a field hockey program as well. We had the first team that played in the NPSL and um, yeah, in a youth academy. So that's where we started. So uh, yeah, from there, just uh, moved to Canada when I got married and uh, started working up there and uh, worked for some pretty large clubs up there. So uh, Hawaii came about. <laughs> so, so How did you find Hawaii. that one? That's, that's uh, quite a few miles away. Just a little bit, not down the road like the other jobs. Uh, you know, Buffalo and uh, Toronto aren't far from each other, so moving between the two wasn't bad. You know, moving to Hawaii, just a little bit. Uh, yeah, I was just lying in bed, and I got emails from the United Soccer Coaches, like the executive director job postings, and uh, one came across in Hawaii. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to apply. <laughs> Like you apply for cool jobs, you never hear anything, and it's just like, eh, maybe. It took a few days, and uh, my wife was like, no, apply, and uh, she's like, I'll move to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, there's probably not many places, yeah. but yeah. that one, sure. Yeah. 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 She's like, I'm not, I'm not moving back to, I'm not moving down to the states. Oh, uh, I'll only move to Hawaii, and I'm like, all right, fine, I'll apply, whatever. And I didn't apply, and she was on me every day. I'm so I applied, um, got through the process. They, they brought me out and uh, got lucky enough that they picked me. So flew out here and you know, moving from club management, where I was running a, a fairly large club, about 5,000 kids up in Mississauga, just outside of Toronto, uh, to running a league. It's much different from, uh, from that. The daily interactions are much different. Just fun. So. Well, I mean, the one similarity is the weather between Buffalo and, and Hawaii. It's yeah. probably pretty similar, right? It's pretty like, similar. There's water, you know. <laughs> it's frozen it's over just, six months of the year. Fr but not it's frozen right. there. <laughs> you can actually yeah, touch different. it. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, dip no, my that, toes every day and it's great. <laughs> it is. It's, it, it looks, I've never been to Hawaii, but, uh, it looks awesome on pictures. So, <laughs> um, that's a long plane ride and you know, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of flying, so that yeah. would be tough for me, but it looks like, you know, kind of looking at the area too. I mean, there's some players that, that come from, you know, come out of Hawaii, you know, on the, on a big yeah. scale. So, you know, there's definitely some talent there. What is the biggest difference you think there, um, like in your new role compared to working on the club side? Uh, my new role. So just, helping out with the, the club managers uh, and the directors of coaching. Uh, so in my club role, I was dealing with the parents more, the, the customers. I wasn't dealing with, and, you know, here, my customers, I only have 28 customers, so <laughs> much <laughs> different. Uh, my last club, I had 4,500 uh, consumers. Wow. And then the customers were the parents, so you've got now 10,000 of them. So it's, right. you're dealing with a lot more um, day-to-day -day craziness of, oh, my little Johnny shorts don't fit. The socks <laughs> are their own side. Like, things like that. And it, it, it's just a lot. I'd get 300-some emails a day there. Here, my first four months, maybe I have 300. So, much different. It's, it's, um, it's probably, you know, you probably still have some issues, but they're just different levels. They're yeah. probably, you know, clubs fighting each other that are competitive yeah. and... <laughs> <laughs> you know, managing, fighting each uh, other. Yeah. yeah. Parents getting kicked out of games because they're being idiots. You know, it, it's that kind of fun stuff. But it's uh, some similarities. But yeah, it, it's just different. Just different scope. So um, yeah. and it's great. We have our own facility. So or we work with the city, but everything's at one location. So. so are you going to? You know, you've started a few teams before. Is there there plans to add one out there as well? You know, as part of the mix. Uh, my idea. Our remit is only youth soccer. Like I floated that idea and everyone's like, oh, that would be so cool. But they're like, but our remit's only youth soccer. And you know, so I, we, do have, we do have an adult meeting, so who knows? Maybe. I, I don't know if you saw like um, Utah youth soccer. Mm -hmm. They've got a, I forget what they call it now. It was PDL. So USL2. Yeah, yeah. They have one of those teams as part of their youth um, soccer association. So I saw some of them, you know, have, you know, have that. Um, how has it been just from going from that NPSL that's more college age to uh, working with the youth? So that's why I ended up at North Mississauga because I really missed uh, being a part of uh, that kind of a program. So coaching in college and, and working with players like at Queen, St Queen City, which is now FC Buffalo, uh, we were successful. So it was great, but I needed a job. <laughs> that's not a full-time <laughs> job. So right. youth soccer is a full-time job. It's much bigger. Uh, so, you know, I missed that at Burlington and Era Mills and, and Mordale. I really missed um, being a part of, uh, you know, going to games, having fans, that interaction with supporters and things like that. that that's what drives me, to be honest. Uh, I learned a lot from guys like Peter Wiltz. Uh, oh, yeah. Got him and talking to him. He's a great person to, to learn from. And uh, so I really miss that. I miss that connection. Um, with the youth game, there's really not that connection. You can do all kinds of like fun marketing things and, and activations and whatnot to include people, but the passion's not there. It's just for their kids. They don't, they don't really understand the whole scope of what you're trying to do because, you know, it's just an activity for their kids. Um, but the games, you're paying money to go, you're connected to it, uh, at least with the supporters. So I missed that. So North Miss, I had that. So that's why I ended up going to North Miss. And we had programs for four-year-olds all the way to the first team in League One Ontario. So yeah, we did lots of cool stuff there. We sold out our, our last home game. We led the league in attendance, merchandise sales. Granted, I think we were the only team that sold merchandise, but we, <laughs> we'll still take that hat and say we, hey, we led the league. <laughs> you were number one. <laughs> we were number one. It's all that matters. <laughs> so yeah, it was, uh, you know, we sold season tickets and so, you know, a lot of the clubs there looked at us as, oh, they come and play us. Wow, you have game day staff. What is this? We had 11 game day staff and we had 20 volunteers that worked every game. We had mobile debit and credit cards. No one else had those things. Uh, it was cash only when they even charged for tickets. We had a merch booth. We had um, halftime entertainment. We did as much as we could and we, we made it a fun experience. Well, I mean, I think that's the key in that. I mean, I've, I've kind of owned and operated teams for 20 years and 
if you're not going to have fun, it's, there's no point in my opinion. I mean, it's, you know, some, some make money, most of them lose money. Um, I've been on both sides of it, but if you're not enjoying it and, and, um, having fun, that's, that's when I decide like, Oh, time for me to do something else. You know, how is the league set up out there? You know, a lot of people might not know about the league. Tell us a little bit about, you know, the structure, how big it is. So uh, our league is one of two soccer leagues here in Hawaii um, for the youth. There's U.S. Club and U.S. Youth Soccer. We're through U.S. Youth Soccer. Um, ours is the biggest on the whole island, or of the islands, and we make up about 94 to 96% of Hawaii soccer. And, um, you know, like I said, we played a 23 field complex that we share with every other soccer organization. There's adult soccer, super old soccer, like all kinds of different soccer, but we all play at the same years. It's kind of crazy. And uh, so, yeah, we run programming for eight year olds through 19 year olds. Um, we've had a couple national champions come through. Uh, we probably would have more, but uh, our families don't like to go to the regionals or the nationals because it costs so much money for them. And everyone in Hawaii works two jobs basically because the cost of living is pretty substantial. Uh, so missing work for that long is very difficult for the family. They don't like leaving for a week. Um, and that's the one thing here. They, they purposely don't enter the state cup competitions like our better teams. So they can't go to regionals. So wow. like if, if you, because uh, they're all in California, I would take it, right? Or, um, they're all over the, the far west region. So okay. it could be in Colorado, it could be in Arizona, it could be up in Seattle or somewhere like that. Or or so uh, it moves around. It's been here too in Hawaii. But uh, yeah, it's significant. So it's, there's actually, if you don't go, the state association, I think, charges you $3,000. So uh, it's like a penalty. So just it's a penalty. Yeah, to, so, yeah. yeah. So you better go. Uh, if you're going to enter this, it's nice to win state cup and say you're the state champion, but you need to go represent us. And uh, so that's been a, a bone of contention with a lot of our organizations. Uh, since I'm on the league level and not the state level, you know, I'm on the state board now, but uh, I, I sit down with all my clubs and I tell them, this is why we're going to do it. I get why. So, so we're just trying to figure out ways to expose our players to, to higher levels for scouting and, and things like that. So, so do you, you help out from the league standpoint on, you know, any of that fundraising or is that kind of all on the teams? Yeah. The individual teams raise their own funds. Uh, so what I'm looking at uh, from the league, we have no, we had no corporate partnerships um, right now. I'm in the middle of three or four of them. So in the next week or two, you'll, you'll see a lot more. Uh, nice. Granted, I've only been here seven months, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it takes time. So, uh, yeah, it takes time. time. So, so we'll have a league partner. We'll have a league equipment partner. Um, we're going to have a match analytics partner as well, because uh, I believe that having the match analytics and the videos and everything are very important. Uh, one for scouting, so the kids can create college videos uh, for themselves, the highlight packages that coaches need, so they're not flying all over the place to go to showcase tournaments which I don't believe in. Uh, I was a college coach and it's tough to go to showcase tournaments because you have 20 some kids to watch and there's only so much time. <laughs> so you can't watch a full game and see little Jimmy out there and hope little Jimmy does something in that 20 minutes that you're watching the game. So it, it could happen that he doesn't even touch the ball. So, <laughs> right. Or he might not even be in. So it is very difficult. So that's one thing. At coach development, um, teaching coaches how to read the game and then using video to help, help them see what they didn't see so they can hopefully be able to adjust things during the game um discipline <laughs> so recording the games we get to, to mail people when they're bad and say no you really did this it's on video there you go um <laughs> and we can use it for marketing there's goals and, and saves of the week that we can do we can use that we can sell that as a property to hopefully get some sponsorships for um you know and the referee development because the referees don't have any mentorship as well right now so Okay. You know, it, it, so that we're looking at in putting that into place. So I, that's one thing that we're really working on right now. So we'll have a partnership with that shortly as well. So it'll be cool. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, just from, from seeing everything online, I mean, it looks like you're making a lot of progress in those, that short time with seven months. Outside of, you know, regular soccer, do, are you guys doing anything um, with futsal out there at all? Yeah, we do futsal. 
Um, there's a beautiful facility here. Um, it's the first thing I did when I got here, what's all going on, like the second day I was here. And I walked in, I was like, oh my goodness, this is beautiful. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of out of, out of the way for a lot of people. Uh, so, and it's way more expensive to play futsal here than it is outdoor, outdoor soccer. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, like in the Northeast, indoor soccer is very expensive because those 11 aside full field turf facilities cost an arm and a leg to build and then to play in. Um, and futsal is a much cheaper option because you can play in gyms and no one has a beautiful facility like this. Here, we've got a beautiful facility that's like those 11 aside facilities that costs significantly more. The cost per game, uh, when you factor out what it costs our players to play, it, and the rosters are smaller, it's almost double what the outdoor game costs, where the rosters yeah. are bigger too. So uh, you're looking at a couple bucks per player per game for outdoor, and you're looking at a heck of a lot more for <laughs> football. So, um, so the families, you know, the, the soccer complex is more central, so the outdoor one. So a lot of our indoor futsal people have left now to just go do football, outdoor soccer. I mean, we can play 365 days a year outside. So. That's what I was, I was about to say. It's like, <laughs> we, we don't need indoor there. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's definitely so, nice. So I'm trying to work with them on uh, the futsal group. Uh, we have basketball courts everywhere, tennis courts everywhere. Can we work with the city? Can we work with the U.S. Soccer Foundation, repurpose some of those and get those um, outdoor soccer courts that they're building all over the place? There's grants available for that. Can we run events throughout the island on those courts? Not necessarily full leagues, but just run one day festival things, get people wanting to play futsal. I love futsal. We grew up playing it in Erie uh, before they built the arenas. Uh, how can we get people involved in it so they can like it and, and play some version of this street ball or something? But, uh, yeah, that's, that's a longer range discussion I'm having with them. But, They've been open to it, so we'll see what they do. But we run the league, uh, but they run the same thing. So. Okay. No, that's good. I mean, I, I think, you know, futsal's a a great, you know, developmental tool. And it, it's – it seems like it's it's really growing in the U.S. right now. I've been, you know, from indoor soccer, we get a lot of players from futsal in other countries, and it really translates well into that. But if you talk to any of the major, you know, stars out there, I mean, they, they credit futsal with a lot of their uh, development. So, you know, you haven't worked out in Hawaii before, right? So this was kind of your first time out there. Yeah. Um, other, Have you been there for vacation or – so the first time, time you were yeah, there, time, yeah. it was like an interview or when you took yep. the job. Wow. Yeah, the interview, yeah. So, yeah. That's that's bold. That's bold. Yeah, and it was. Hey, I moved to Red Deer, Alberta for a brief time to, to run an organization there. I made that mistake. <laughs> what was kind of, <laughs> what was really like the driving force for that? Like in, in my first, you know, episode, I kind of talk a little bit about my ultimate, you know, career goals. What What's your ultimate career goals and is this kind of, you know, positioning you to get there? Um, or is this just, you wanted to be involved in youth soccer and live in paradise? A little paradise comes in, yeah, paradise comes into play in that. Um, I won't lie, I, I want to work for an MLS club. I, I want to be in upper management there. Uh, or work for US soccer, US youth, or Canada soccer, Ontario soccer. Um, I want to be in the higher levels of the game. I want to be in governance, um, kind of where my path has gone. Like, I'm a, I'm a decent coach. I'm not, I'm not the worst coach, but right. am I, Am I uh, Gary Klopp? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not even close. So am I a, a good youth coach? Yeah, I'm better than most, I think. Um, but I knew coaching wasn't where I was going to be. <laughs> right. Uh, the front office is kind of where I wanted to be. I can work with the coaches, give them my advice. So you guys follow it. No, I don't care if they follow it. But <laughs> I, can, I can kind of guide them. On, hey, I believe in strong vis uh, club cultures. I love reading about Ajax. I love reading about Liverpool, uh, Barcelona, like how they built their structures and how they integrate, you know, all the coaches and all the staff um, and just make it a, a whole business. It, it, the, the business side of things interests me more than the X's and O's more or less. I, like I still go down that rabbit hole and I'm in there all the time with the X's and O's, but uh, the business side and the cultural is more important to me. So that's where I'm going to be. Uh, so who knows? You know, my contract's here for three years. I've got two and a half years left now. Who knows where I'll end up? I could stay forever, live in paradise, right. know, drink my ties here on the beach, but uh, <laughs> or you know, I could be an MLS. Uh, it's, ultimately, that's my goal. So. Well, the one thing I've learned over the years is, you know what you 
you know, you have different goals or objectives and sometimes um, different things come into play and, and it modifies. That's, I, I said the same thing where, where I'm at, you know, my plan is probably not to be here the rest of my career, but sometimes, you know, things change. Um, I think it's cool though. MLS, um, the league is, is really kind of headed in the right direction. And, you know, I, I think just in general, I think, you know, soccer in the U S I mean, if you look USL and I think it was the NASA or NISA, uh, I think it was another one that's popping up. And, you know, I remember a few years back where the USL teams were pretty easy to get. And now they're, <laughs> now they're, they're not. Um, MLS at and, 90, in 99, 2000, it was like 3 million or something to buy in. Think now about like that. 300 million. <laughs> it's like, yeah, they're they're more expensive than a lot of NHL teams right now. They're more expensive than almost any team in Europe to buy. There's a lot of like really? rich people that are buying teams in Europe because they're getting them cheaper than MLS teams. But, uh, but yeah, and, and there's that dream of promotion relegation. That's why they buy teams over there. But uh, you ever think that'll happen here in the U.S.? You sign a franchise agreement, you're paying 300 million. You're gonna go down to that'd be like uh, the Yankees going down to single A ball, some short season right. ball. They had that opportunity. You think that's gonna happen ever? No. Why? I mean, <laughs> do you think that it it works there because that's just the way it's been forever? Or like, yeah. I mean, because I think. In America, I think we're kind of greedy, and I think that alone will not let it happen um, because oh. people have invested so much. And mm -hmm. in the U.S., in North America, Canada, in the U.S., it's entertainment. It's not the 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 city's thing. Like it, it, the city basically owns it. It's like the Green Bay Packers everywhere. Like everyone, like yeah, they have owners and stuff, but it's literally the city's property. So everyone's really invested into what they do. Like, yeah, you go to a, a Ravens game or wherever, a Steelers game. Yeah, everyone in the city is wearing their, their, their jerseys. But it, it literally is a, their community thing that they do. Um, and it was always structured that way just to make things fair. But if you look at the Premier League, if you look at all the, maybe not the Bundesliga, but if you, well, maybe the Bundesliga, yeah. um, and all the bigger leagues, they would get rid of promotion relegation in a second. They don't want it. They hate it. Um, Mexico just got rid of it. And <laughs> so there's already one bigger league. Mexico is the biggest league in the Western Hemisphere, and they just got rid of it. Uh, they got rid of it because one of their most popular teams last year was going to get relegated. So <laughs> they did some shady stuff and just said, oh, no more relegation. <laughs> but, you know. You and there's a lot of money at stake, you yeah, know. And, and, and you those balloon payments if you get relegated. Like if you watch that Sunderland documentary on, uh, on Netflix, they're in like – the equivalent to double a ball now so they've gone from the premier league down and talk about a lost investment right there <laughs> yeah they are getting destroyed uh, financially and they can't get promoted back up and it, it, it's funny to watch it's heartbreaking and funny to watch it's just like oh god it's like lucy taking the ball from them every time try this thing try to kick it uh they just can't get to the next level again and financially it's really bad. so uh, i don't think it's wise and French, they're not franchises in North America. We're franchises. It's right. different. So it will never happen here. Uh, it's romantic. It's a great idea. It's good to talk about. <laughs> like, if it would happen, I could see it happening at like college level with the different divisions. And if you want to move up, then you can. If you don't want to move up, you can't. But it, it, if it hasn't happened in baseball, then why would it happen in soccer? Yeah, yeah, I just, just I think it's, it. it's just different. I mean, sports in the U S are, you know, a lot different than, than Europe and, you know, most parts of the world. So definitely uh, don't see, I mean, maybe like, you know, the USL, if they, you know, do something internally, but again, What's the difference, <laughs> like, but, like the only difference like, is why? TV money over there. Like you get more yeah. if you're in the top league, it like, what's USL going to say? Okay. Um, you get more, TV money for what? Like to be in the yeah. first, in USL one versus USL two or, or USL uh, championship or USL one. Like there is no TV money. So like, yeah, what's, <laughs> what's, what's the reward? Oh, you get to travel more because there's less teams in USL uh, championship than there is in USL one. So now your expenses go up, but your revenue doesn't. So, and I don't see teams, <laughs> I don't see teams, you know, willing to, to spend that money to, 
to achieve that. You you kind of hit it on the head. I mean, it's entertainment in the U.S. a lot. So I I really wasn't a huge soccer fan until I bought a soccer team. <laughs> you yeah, know, so. played as a kid, and so. But because of that, like I've become a big fan. Now I can't rattle off all the names throughout the world of teams, but um, it definitely, you know, is of interest. My son has played um, competitively. My daughter played in high school for a year. Um, how do you think, you know, I mean, do you think that youth soccer in the U.S. and where you're at is kind of headed in the right direction, or what do you feel is needed to kind of, get us more competitive on a global stage? Well, um, today there was a big announcement that was that no one knew about, which kind of snuck out, so that was kind of cool. Um, MLS and USU Soccer, the league our, our league belongs to, just formed a partnership to uh, help with the regional and uh, national competitions where MLS is going to pick up the tab for the players that get invited into these things before um, the identification network. You got to try out, pay like two hundred fifty dollars for the tryout, and then pay another three hundred some dollars to go to some camp, and then you get hopefully seen by someone. So it's just yeah. money upon money upon money. So MLS just literally announced it like an hour before we started this. So, uh, oh nice! It, it looks really promising. Uh, I just spoke to the state director as well, and he's he's excited by it. He had no clue, and they're on calls every week. They were just being told, "Hey, something's coming. We can't talk about it because we're negotiating." But uh, so he's excited. I'm pretty excited. But when you look at, uh, we missed the last World Cup. Oh my God, the sky's falling. Like, it, it's terrible. That was because of what was done in player development and everything in the early 2000s to mid 2000s. Right? Just those early aughts. It was very awful <laughs> what we were doing. It was all about money. Yes, still about money now. But it was all about money and kids were flying all over the place to play in tournaments. And it was stupid. Like you'd fly from North Carolina to San Diego to play one good game because one good team over there for your got soccer rankings because these got soccer rankings are ridiculous. Um, sorry, I'm friends with so got soccer guys, but these <laughs> rankings are silly. But, um, you know, they're flying all over to get these points. So college coaches go, oh, this team's ranked number one in the nation or number five. So they've got all these good players. So parents are spending tons of money just to go fly around. Was that fixed? Not really, but it kind of was. Um, at least it was regionalized travel, which is still ridiculous because <laughs> um, teams are traveling from like Nashville to Buffalo to play a U U13 game, which is still not a close drive. Um, so, so things started, but US Soccer put in some standards for coaching, how many times you train, what the coaches should be doing. Um, and that definitely helped. They got rid of the DA just because they were spending $9 million or $12 million a year on it. And with the financial issues coming up now, they uh, spun it off. MLS picked that up um, and is running with it. It's the same program, more or less. But MLS has now included the voices of the people that run the clubs, where U.S. Club Soccer said, we know everything. We're from Europe. So go screw yourselves. Um, I don't care about high school soccer. I don't care about this. We know what we're doing. Yeah. Go away, you Americans that don't know anything, <laughs> even though we, you hired us. But that's the way it was. And uh, it's not probably the best way to run your business. And so, so they had a lot of issues. Uh, but through the DA, the Development Academy, we've had a lot of players go to Europe. So yeah, we've missed, we missed the World Cup. Ah, world's sky's falling. But now we have all these young players at Ajax, at PSV, at uh, Dortmund. We have some at Barcelona. Like We have them at big clubs. In Europe, and they're on their youth teams. We never had that before. We had one or two. We had like Landon Donovan, John O'Brien, and that's it. And now we've got a whole team of like multiple teams of kids over there. And so, so it looks better. Um, talking to agents and whatnot, they're like, no, we have a lot of kids there. So who knows? Uh, it's a start. We've never had it. So it can only get better. Yeah. You can't miss the World Cup in 2026. We're hosting it. So that's good. That's, uh, <laughs> We'll see yeah, no. Hopefully, it continues to improve, and you know the numbers go the numbers go up, and the development. You know, I mean, I think that's that's a key with you at the league level. I I know that uh, just from you know operating leagues at the minor league level, um, dealing with teams was always <laughs> it was always 
a challenge. <laughs> and, you know, I think you really, you know, the leadership really has to be strong to be able to get everyone aligned. And so, you know, how do you work on that and how do you manage that aspect of it where, you know, everyone needs to kind of see the same vision and kind of be working together and then on the, let the, the competition happen on the field. But um, a lot of times it crosses over into to everything else. But so how do you really manage and, and try to lead that side of it to, to have that growth where you're at? Yeah, it's uh, been interesting because we've got clubs that are very, very small uh, and clubs that are very large uh, that have gobbled up a lot of little clubs and amalgamated them. Uh, they have different political beliefs. <laughs> they, they talk politics with me. I try to keep it away from that, but uh, it, it's funny how politics gets involved in that too. Because they, they have a certain way of looking at things. So at least it helps me understand where they're coming from. Uh, my goal is to facilitate all the kids having an opportunity to progress in Hawaii soccer. Uh, so what I've learned over the last few weeks is it's not just Oahu I need to concentrate on, but any um, idea that I'm having for Oahu, I can bring to the state board and they're like, oh, why didn't you bring this to us before? This is great. We'd all love to do this. So we may be most of Hawaiian soccer, but uh, a lot of the ideas I have, they're pretty receptive to. Uh, the bigger clubs, their competitive advantage is that they can offer coaching development, match analytics, everything I want to do for the whole league. They're not happy with because <laughs> because it's that's even the playing field. Yeah, it yeah. evens the playing field. I understand that, but you still will be the best one. You're the biggest one. You're going to have the most kids, but you have to you have to give everyone that opportunity because just having one club with I don't know sixty kids in an age group doesn't mean that that's the only club to play for. There's 28 organizations to play for. So we need to give everyone those tools because it, you know, steel strings and steel or whatever it's the saying is, but I can't remember. <laughs> it, it's like, or iron sharp is iron. It, you, need to, you need to have everyone on that same level playing field and then let the best one win. It's not, it, it doesn't work for us. We're not developing as many players as we should be if only one organization is doing it. I need all 28 doing it. And so how can I, it, with the, the state association, how can we as a league, you know, provide coaching development, provide a coaching the coaches uh, monthly session where we all get together, and we work on coaching topics at the pitch, and then we go eat later. So we create that camaraderie. So when you're on the field, you know, you're not jerks to each other. You can you can still you want to beat your friends more than you want to beat your enemies. It's, it so makes it so it, much sweeter. It, yes, it is sweeter. So <laughs> let's become friends and let's all you know get on the field together, kick a ball around, and then you know go out to eat afterwards. But we're teaching each other at the same point. How can I how can I find leaders that will help us um, and the clubs grow by giving if it's a coach the coaches program, the coaches are the ones leading that program. So one day it's a club from Hawaiian soccer or a coach from Hawaiian soccer academy. Another day it's from Hawaii Rush. Another day it's from Surf. Um, they're taking the leadership. It may not be the directors of coaching. It could be just a coach there. Oh, I want to do this topic and, and show what I've I've learned. You know, but we've done that at other organizations, and it's really taken off. And it shows you who the leaders are of the organization. So if I can do that on a lead scale, that's cool. So, and I mean, you know, sure. the competition is just gonna it's going to push everybody, which is great. I mean, obviously when you're the top guy, you don't, you want to, you want to stay there. But um, I mean, I think that's great that you're really trying to, you know, level that playing field. And also, you know, again, you're, it sounds like your, you know, mission is to develop youth soccer um, throughout your league. And that's not rush or somebody else. That's the entire league and the better that can develop, I think the better it will be for uh, the competition throughout. From there, we'll get, you know, maybe we get a senior league. There, there's, uh, do we have to join the NPSL or UPSL? No, I don't think we do. We've got enough soccer playing here on the island that we should be able to have six teams, our own division, if you want to say, our own league. We don't have to go play national titles and things like that. Just let's come play here. Uh, you know, we've got wonderful facilities besides our own stadium that we have at the soccer park. Uh, we have lots of NFL players that come from Hawaii and Division One, so they have beautiful state high school stadiums. Here. Like, can we form something like that where we have, you know, in our youth levels, can we have all of Rush play all of Surf one day, and then at night it's capped off by Rush for Surf senior game? 
like how can we do that? So um, that's where I'm trying to. That's my ultimate vision for three years, three four years down the line. But we'll see where we go. So. No, I mean that sounds like a great plan. And I guess you know, is there a lot of opportunity to? grow the league as far as numbers or are you pretty much capped out from that standpoint um unlike the rest of the country our numbers never really declined uh, so if you look at the aspen institute they've done studies on youth sports participation uh, soccer is especially hit across the country across north america us and canada um, our numbers stayed relatively straight so we'll find out what happens now uh, you know we're always taught when we're going through school, hey, you need to have an operating reserve because what if soccer can't be played? How's your organization going to live? And Hello. everyone laughed. Everyone <laughs> always laughed because, okay, maybe the competitive side goes down, but the recreational side's still there. It, right. it will be fine. Don't worry. Yeah, now <laughs> we kind of we kind of chuckle, but we're all like crying because it's like, oh my god, this really hit. Yeah, um, we've been saying it. It came yeah, true. Yeah, who would have ever thought? But. Uh, you know, I think our numbers will be okay, but uh, you know, my board asked me to, to look into the numbers between 2007 and 2009 when we had the economic downturn. Our revenues actually went up and our players went up. So I can't use that as an indicator of what's going to happen now. But now, um, like 33% of our workforce is on unemployment here. So how fast is that? Like I said, the military and tourism are, are economic drivers here. How fast is that tourism going to turn around where everyone starts to get hired back and the parents have some disposable income for their children to play soccer? Um, it, it, it might be tougher on those bigger clubs because they, they have coaches they have to pay for. The smaller clubs may not have to pay their coaches as much. Right. They don't have the full infrastructure that the bigger clubs have. So I don't know. Maybe the bigger clubs hurt more than those smaller clubs. I, think, I don't know. So have you been able to do anything? Like, is it everything kind of just at a halt there in Hawaii now or? I'm busier now. <laughs> uh, really? Um, so I work from home anyways. Uh, we don't have okay. an office yet. Okay. So, uh, so that's been put on hold looking for an office. So I've been working there. Anyway. So I basically, the only thing that's changed is I don't go to the park on the weekends to watch soccer, which okay. was a, a very small part of my job because I have operations staff that run the league. Um, so yeah, no, I've been creating, um, educational, uh, seminars or webinars for the, uh, the clubs and the coaches, um, there's five topics. The first one, I just finished the third part of the first topic. Thank God. It took me forever. Um, uh, it's on governance, finance, risk management, budgeting was the first section. So that part's all done now. Um, uh, next part is on marketing, uh, brand management, social media, um, that's the next part. Uh, then there's on uh, staff and leadership development. And then there's on coaching development and coaching uh, planning, uh, session planning. And the last part is on uh, player development programming and, and match analytics and things like that. So um, it's about 20 weeks worth of stuff. So I take <laughs> it's like eight to nine hours a week plus, you know, of research and then uh, putting all my notes together and then, then putting all the graphics together because I, I do it all on Word, then I export it to uh, some new thing I found on uh, on Microsoft. I don't even know the name of it. But <laughs> and it like makes like a cool little website, puts pictures in it, or helps me find oh, pictures nice. for it. And then I take that and put it into PowerPoint and uh, record it and uh, post it. So uh, yeah, so I mean now so, now's a great time though to develop and do a lot of the stuff that um, you you necessarily can't do. Um, when you're in the grind of it, I mean, I, I, my situation's a little different here being in a minor league sports team, but right now it's about developing, you know, the staff that we have. So anything we can do to try to develop them. And I think the same would go with coaching and, you know, with, with zoom and other technologies out there now. I mean, I've seen people doing um, soccer training sessions, live, you know, remote sessions. So you know, with technology, I think it really opens up a lot. Well, anything else uh, that you want to, you know, share with us that we didn't uh, cover? I think, I think we, we, we covered a lot of great stuff. I mean, it was really great to learn more about, uh, you know, your background and, and what you're looking to do because you never know, maybe we'll be in that MLS front office together somewhere in the future. 
I've been having fun watching the, the videos on the, the baseball park and everything. So <laughs> yeah, try to try to have fun and use social media. You know, it's a great it can be a great tool for you. When I uh, get back east, I'll have to come out to a game down there. So. Likewise, maybe I'll get to Hawaii sometime. I don't know. There you go. <laughs> I could take a boat, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of a flight. It's like uh, twelve hours. <laughs> I remember. Yeah. Fl- flying out, they flew me down to DC first, and then DC straight over to Honolulu. I was like, Oh Whoa. my lord, this is like how long, long of a flight, flight is that? Um, DC to Honolulu, I think was ten or eleven hours straight or something like that. And so, I don't know. I don't know if I could be on a plane that long. <laughs> I have one of those cocoons, maybe, or something. Yeah. Yeah, I, I pay the extra hundred some bucks to get the extended late leg uh, seating, so yeah, I can, it's always I can good. relax. But uh, yeah, it's it's a long flight. Yeah. Well, no, thanks, thanks for joining me, and let's let's keep in touch. I mean, I'm uh, you know I'm following you on LinkedIn and and online, so you're doing a great job. Um, keep it up, but uh, thanks again for joining me. And thank you for listening to today's episode of The Andrew Haynes Show. If you enjoyed it, we encourage you to follow or subscribe to the podcast so you can get updates when we release new episodes. Take care.